Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, Gnosis, mysticism, art, cartooning, uh, graphic art, graphic novels, whatever else we feel like talking about. Uh, I'm Deacon Jonathan Stewart, joined by my co-host Jason Memel, who I know is extra excited about today's show. Hello, Jason. I'm, a, I'm so excited. This is, we were, even before the show started, we've been riffing on stuff that I'm just like giddy about. So, okay. yes, cool. super excited. And the show is with uh, living legend uh, Jim Woodring, who's going to be talking to us about his upcoming adaptation of A Voice Arcutus. I uh, hope I'm saying that right, which is a uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, Gnostic y novel from, from 1920, uh, which we're really going to, to do a dive in. And we're, I'm hoping that, that Jim can explain to me uh, what this book is or help me to understand it. But it's a fascinating tome. And of course, I'm looking quite forward to his interpretation of it. Anyways, Jim, hello. Thanks for joining us. Hello, how are you guys? <laughs> we're good. Thanks we're so extra good. good. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, this, this, Talk about this possible to talk about the book. <laughs> This, this this book, you, you know, the, I, I've said this on the show before, right? But but sometimes, uh, you know, talking about writing is 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 like dancing about painting. Uh, so so just, just trying to talk about this book is is probably going to exhaust the limits of language. Uh, and of course, we hardly encourage people to, you know, what? Don't read this book. Buy Jim's version of this book. Then you could read the, the text version. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but before we get into this, I, I have to do a, a quick commercial. It's actually going to be quick this time uh, uh, because this is one of our bonus shows. This is not actually supported by Patreon. We do this completely as a bonus, a gift to you, and it really is a gift because this show is super exciting with super exciting uh, guests. But normally, we cannot make the show without people helping us out by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic or doing one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. Okay, there we go. Uh, Jim, we can get into it. Uh, can you please tell us about your adaptation of A Voyage to Arcusia? Um, like, what was the genesis of you adapting it? And, and what was the experience uh, actually like? Because I, I, um, to, to take su such a work and to reinterpret it in, and recreate it in, in this new form. Well, I can't really discuss the process of illustrating it and in a way that makes sense, unless you're somewhat familiar with the book. Because the book is a one of a kind, strange, heavy, unclassifiable, indigestible lump of fantasy and adventure and low level metaphysics. And it's a good document of something, but it's very, very hard to say what. So um, I would have to describe the book a little bit to have this make sense. For one thing, it's written in a kind of prose that almost everybody who tries it out finds very, very difficult to get through. The names are strange and awkward. It's a blend of trite cliches and stunning feats of imagination, tremendous originality. It seems to have been infused with a kind of pre-Raphaelite sensibility. All the women are wearing robes with loose flax and hair and the men are all archetypes. Uh, it's like science fiction, but it doesn't do anything with science fiction. There's no real world building. The only things we see are sort of appear for the lead character, Maskell, and then they, you don't think about him again. There's no houses or cities, really. Um, Maskell uh, doesn't behave in a way that I recognize as human. He doesn't speak or act or think like a human being. And once he gets to this other planet, he, and he well, never mind, I'll put that off for later, but um, you realize it's a strange, melange of fantasy that doesn't really go anywhere or really seem to mean anything, but it's kind of endlessly mind-blowing. Yeah. And one of the problems with illustrating it is that it seems like a visual book because it tackles subjects or deals in things that are fun to think about, and you're given lots of clues about them. But Maskell himself, who is on every page of the book, even when he's dead because he moves into another body, uh, He's described in about three sentences. He's a giant, 
stronger than most giants. He has a black hair and a beard and a face that looks as if it's carved out of wood. And that's all the visual information you get. Yeah. So when I was working on this originally, I tried to draw a picture of him as if he were a man. And I kept getting these faces that looked like a guy with kind of a face that looked like it was carved in a beard and hair, but I couldn't say, oh, that's Maskell. In fact, I could never come up with a drawing out of the dozens I did where I could say, that's the guy, he's my character, because he's not somebody who looks like anything. He's a shape-shifting cipher yeah. who goes on this incredible trip. And, you know, the basic thing is that the, the short of it is he takes a spaceship to another planet. Now, once he gets there, he acts like an adolescent having his first lucid dream. He He... He just kind of proceeds through this procession of people and he argues with the women. He's just a guest on this planet and he's lecturing everybody constantly. He kills the men he doesn't like. He just acts out in a way that he would never do at home. And I have to say it's a lot of fun to read because it's so id and so wish fulfillment and so wonderful to think that if you went to another planet and you were talking to a beautiful alien woman who tried to seduce you by grinding her pelvis against your um, region while sitting in front of you on a flying bird and you're resisting it with all your might. I mean, it's like weird fantasy stuff. I, that's evident, isn't it? Um, you can see I'm running out of, of words to describe it. Yeah, I, I got to say, I, I really enjoyed the book, but when you were talking about some of the challenges related to the prose, as well as just the, the sort of mind-breaking plot, if you want to call it a plot, I, I must have turned to my partner at, at least a hundred times and just said, what is this effing book? <laughs> what am I reading? And uh, I, I almost feel like, and, and this is in my questions later, but but it almost led to like an altered state of being. And like, it almost felt like it lodged itself in, in one of my, my frontal lobes. <laughs> it, it, there's really, really nothing quite quite like it. Um, do you know anything about, about the author, David Lindsay? This was his first book. As I said, it came out in 1920 and it sold 600 copies. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know how much is known about him. He was born around 1975 and died around 1945. He was born in Scotland, lived in London, was married, had a day job, gave it up so that he could be a full-time writer was a failed full-time writer, and I guess his life was uncomfortable and, and unpleasant to the extent that when his teeth started to go bad, he just let them go bad and they killed him. Mm -hmm. And that was attributed by people who knew him, evidently, as a sign of his fatalism. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, he, wrote, he wrote all these books he wrote. They're almost as if he just sort of went into himself and opened himself up so you could prowl around in all of these trains, these, these caverns of thought that he had opened up and explored himself. But it's extremely pointless. You know, it's, there's all the experience, people talk, speak of that book as if it were a metaphysical document that had lessons and value to it. And I don't think it does at all. I, I, there's every nothing happens in it that is super sensuous. Yeah, it's all on that level. And there's a lot of stupid philosophy, a lot of sexual politics, a lot of just dumb machismo, and you know. But but then on the other hand, it's all coupled with this incredible. It's the greatest sustained work of imagination I know of. The, the most original. When you describe the individual vignettes, like Iron Tit, the lake that is played by your feet, and when amateurs do it, they destroy everything around. That's a nice idea. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, I'm just getting bogged down. There's just too many fantastic ideas in this book. Matter Play, where he goes and he walks through a stream and all of nature's inner workings are on display to him. Things become transparent, they emerge, they grow, they disgorge other forms. It's a wonderful fever dream of an idea described in tremendous detail that is nevertheless not visual yeah. and very difficult to picture. 
without resorting to all of the science fiction cliches that we've seen. You know, we've seen so many imaginary worlds where creatures bubbled up out of the bog and things came down from the sky and all that. Those visual tropes are no longer fascinating to us. In fact, they're a little tedious. Yeah. Is, uh, so, well, what I'm getting at is it's hard to imagine, I think, what a kind of special effects breakthrough that was at the time. That was a really unique piece of writing. And my understanding mm -hmm. is that the book that I have, the 1920 edition, is a bridge. The original is long. I mean, mine is 63. The original is longer. You get a first mm -hmm. edition longer than the subsequent editions. I like one thing that I've I've had a sense of is that it it's it's incredibly unique yet it yet it is also sort of uh, very much of its time in a genre sense. Like um, I'm thinking of like uh, like Lovecraft is is a little later than this I think um, uh, in terms of writing and it's got like I think also that spiritism like it starts with a seance you know very much, very much. that uh, uh, it, like it feels like it's uh, I don't mean this deeply critically, but it has that sort of like period where people were self-publishing a whatever it is they were thinking. And Jim, or, uh, not Jim, your Jim, <laughs> David Lindsay's uh, um, content just happened to kind of crack through into this level of weirdness that that sort of takes it beyond any of these sort of seance parlor dramas that people were writing. Um, or the, where Lovecraft went, which was more of a existential science fiction, like um, uh, where, yeah, whereas David Lindsay, as you, as you were kind of saying, is he just pouring out these ideas almost unconcerned about any like dramatic arc or character, uh, character growth or even character uh, foundation. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's just a vehicle for like the next crazy idea. Exactly right. Yeah. And I, and I, you're, I, I hadn't really seen it in that light, but your observations that he was a part of his time, not just influenced, but trying to contribute to it in that way. That that I hadn't really thought of that before, that what he was he was contributing to that, you know, Ibsen, Theosophy, Egypt, post raphaelite all that stuff, Freud stuff that was opening up, and he wanted to contribute. His subsequent books, the ones I've read, um, do away with all that. They're about men and women having endless conversations. And with those books in particular, The uh, Haunted Woman and, the, and the, the Violet Apple and The Witch, um, they do a better job of what I like about Voyage to Arcturus, which is that they dispense with the clutter and they get down to what he does best. And to me, he's not so much a storyteller as a medium. He uses words to induce in his readers this sticky, gray, gluey feeling as if you're caught in a paralyzing aspect created by derailing the engine of sex and having it do something else entirely. So you've got that energy, but no outlet for it except to talk constantly. And there's men and women talk, 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 talk. talk. And they, you know, it's all sexual politics, it's all power struggle, it's all him trying to get laid while not being a brute, you know, and wrestling with himself. There's no religion in it at all. There's no Buddhism, there's no Vedanta, there's no Christianity except for the moral straitjacket that Maskell is in. So it really doesn't have anything to do except for his imagination and all the symbols that his mind has whipped up to help him cope with his problems, is how I see it. Yeah. I but that's the main thing, that mood, that mood of quasi-sexual. It feels like you're indulging in a bad habit when you succumb to it. You feel like, oh, this is, I shouldn't be getting into this like this. This is, yeah, this is backwards. It was maladjusted or something, you know, yeah. But yeah. I really, really, really like it. And I've plowed through those turgid books of his and there's, you know, it's, it's one of a kind stuff. But when it came to illustrating it, um, you know, I tried several different attempts. For one thing, I tried to think of what uh, an artist like Virgil Findlay would have done with it, which would have been wonderful. Or Norman Lindsay, that would have been wonderful. And I, I can't draw like those guys, so I couldn't even attempt that. But I did attempt a few different kind of things, kind of a sculpture garden approach, kind of a semi-cartoony approach, and they just didn't, 
I just couldn't do anything that worked at all. And I realized that even if somebody really good like Norman Lindsay had illustrated it and drawn those characters in a way that I found satisfying as drawings, they would have missed the mark as representations of the characters in this book, as far as I'm concerned, because these characters are not about what they look like or how they act or the expressions on their faces or how their robes are actually put together or anything like that. It's about a bunch of stupefied entities bum you know, bumbling around in this world. And uh, I mean, that's how I see it. Everybody is, everybody who seems like they're in control isn't. Everybody who presents a superior exterior seems to uh, get flattened by Maskell. Yeah. Um, so what I did, you want to see the, uh, I'm not really authorized to show these pictures, but I can show you the drawing that I did for the dust jacket, because that's, I mean, the, the slip case, because that's been released. Oh, please, yes. I happen to have it right here. Oh, wonderful. It's a pen and ink I'm, I was just keeping myself from saying, God, yes, please. Yeah, 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 oh, it's amazing. So that's Maskell, you can see his yeah. face there. It's, it's barely human. And yeah. the clothes he's wearing are like some kind of crazy, embroidered regalia livery or something, you know? He's holding a match. This is for the back. This is a scene where he's in the observatory and he's in a stairwell and there's a lens set in the wall. And when he looks through the lens, he sees the far off Arcturus and the planet Tormance, which I immediately thought was symbolized the torment of romance. Mm -hmm. And so this is a die cut and you'll see on the book that little star system but the whole thing is illustrated more or less in this style so like the book itself it gives you the impression of things happening but you're not you're not locked into any particular surface you're seeing just a flow of moods and craziness and the kind of stuff that makes the book up that was my goal <laughs> yes well and this is this is kind of i think what like looking at that image and uh what i've experienced of the book makes me think that like it's actually providence that you are the one that, that you are creating an illustration in the series for this book that, that, that this is if if uh if, I, if somebody hadn't like if i hadn't already seen that it was happening and somebody asked me who could do a good job at this i would list you as high on that list like uh, just based on your previous work like uh, frank is a great example of like work that seems like it can evoke uh such a myriad of ideas while also being cohesive. Well, thank you. Thank you for all that. Yeah. I illustrated it not because I thought I would do a good job of it, but because when I was offered the opportunity to do one of their books, I, that was the first one I thought of. It seemed like mm. the biggest challenge. And also, I really liked the idea of having a voyage to Arcturus, Arcturus, Arcturus published in a beautiful, I mean, a lavish slip color covered edition, you know? Yeah. This poor, obscure, neglected, hated book. Because a lot of people can't stand it because of the way it's written. And it doesn't resonate with them. Probably doesn't resonate with most people. Do you know what? No, never mind. But um, it's a, it, anyhow, that was one of my big motivations. The idea that, uh, I mean, here's, here's, most people's copies are old, beaten up, dog-eared things, you know, the idea that, like I've already said it, nice idea, old obscure book comes out as beautiful, slip-covered edition, beautifully designed, beautifully produced. Those people at Beave Hive Books do one hell of a job, no question. Yeah. And I'm uh, sure that uh, David uh, Lindsay would hate my drawings. <laughs> hate them. But maybe I would be able to persuade him that they were such a pure homage to the genius of his book that I couldn't risk doing anything criticizable. I could only stand aside and make frantic noises of cheerleading, which is what my drawings are. Maybe he would have seen love come to, you know, maybe it ultimately would have been okay with him, but yeah. probably not. He seems like he was a very conservative, unhappy man. Uh, that's I didn't know about him. 
the from from the little that that I've read of his biography, which which you basically already stated, and and of course we can't always judge uh, creators by their work, uh, but judging by his work, he was a very repressed and and unhappy man. But that said, I, honestly, Jim, I wouldn't be surprised if if your version really becomes the version uh, of the book because people have so much difficulty with the prose. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if you really give this book a new life. You see a trade paperback in its future? I, I sure do, yeah. The other thing about it is that I just did these pen and ink drawings because that's my medium. And um, what, uh, and I'm ashamed of myself because I cannot remember her name, the person who's designing this. But she uh, has done all the other books and they're, they're fantastic. So what she will do with my pen and ink drawings will be great. I have no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, I apologize to you if you're watching this for forgetting your name. <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. Will you? Thank you. Please yeah. stay. So uh, just to, uh, I have some questions on the sheet that really you've already covered, but if we could just go back to them just a little bit, if you have anything more to say, but but sort of two things, which is like, I, I've actually heard about this book for a long time because a lot of creators I know, because it is a pretty obscure book, but they, they really like it. And, and I've always heard that, that it has Gnostic themes, and obviously I'm very interested in Gnosticism, so we'll get to that. But, but I've you know, so I've only read about the book until I actually read it for this interview. It's always been on my list. Uh, but a lot of people talk about it as as a book of philosophy. And, and like you were saying, I was expecting the dialogue. And then I kept expecting it as the book went on for for him to eventually have these encounters where, where he sort of has recognizable philosophical <laughs> uh, deep discussions with these beings. But that never really happens. And, and I, I find that that a lot of the, the dialogue is is riddles. Um, it, and it, 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 it's just people saying sort of puzzling things back and forth to each other. Uh, and the things that are recognizable, as, as you pointed out, often seem to have to do with, with sex, power, and gender. But everything else just seems to be riddles. But so one, I'm, I'm getting to a question here. Like, do you find that adds to the, the dream logic of the book? Like this, this weird dialogue, this riddles of people talking to the, this, uh, each other to create this atmosphere of miasma? And, and two, um, so sort of a related question that that that, that you you touched on, but but Maskell is um, such such a riddle himself, right? You already discussed this, but in modern writing, uh, you, they really want you to have a, an empathetic connection to the main character. You you see their backstory, you see their motivations, you tie you spend time in their heads, but you don't get any of that with Maskell. No. no. So, so d d d is that is that on purpose? Um, so yeah, so two questions about, about that dialogue and, and about the character of Maskell. <laughs> well, um, my observations are the same. I, whether it's intentional or not, I guess it is, but I think he must have missed the mark. I think he just took this so seriously that he stripped it of all frivolity. The only lighthearted chatter at all is by among the people at the seance before everything goes to shittery. So... And those people seem frivolous and stupid. But even when they're talking to each other about what's going to happen that evening, they're scowling at each other and frowning and taking offense, but remaining silent. There's this, we get this uh, portrayal of human relationships as being extremely strained and empty. Yeah. When Maskell, the guy comes in, what their relationship with Maskell and Knights for, the names are the worst. The names are embarrassing. Maskell, Night Spore, Joy Wind. It's so trite and stupid. But he, uh, you know, the guy comes to the seance, um, Crag, and kills the, the apparition. And then they just kind of drift to this observatory. Yeah. And then they go in and all these kind of strange things happen, including... Uh, they have to strip to get on the spaceship. Yep. So they strip, and then two of the men start kind of playfully wrestling with each other and grappling with each other, which they didn't do when they were clothed. Now they can't. It, they, it seems like it had to happen. Yeah. And that kind of happens. And then they get into this thing, which is described in you know, one sentence as a crystal torpedo, I think. 
whether that means faceted or made of glass or what it means, nobody can say. And he gets in, he falls asleep, wakes up, he's naked on this planet. And then he just wanders through it like somebody going through the illusion mysteries, taking in things, but he interacts with them. He kills people and argues with the women and re re resists their seductions until the, near the end. And I forget the name of the woman who finally breaks down his defenses, but it's not all it could be somehow. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Gnosticism, I don't know very much about what that means, except that it's old and it's sort of a, is it sort of a reaction to Christianity or a, a corrective or something? Uh, basically, the quick answer to both those questions would be, would be yes. I, I think that it's, it's, uh, that, that it's a pre-Christian movement that can combine with other religions and, and ways of thought and sort of interrogates them. So when, it, when Christianity comes along, not long after uh, the origins of Gnosticism, it sort of combines with Christianity, but also reinterprets and reexamines its, uh, uh, its narratives and its myths. So, right. yeah. So, and of course, it also throws... Christianity. Sorry? It pre-existed Christianity. Yes, that that's controversial. A, a lot of a lot of scholars used to believe that, and newer scholars mostly don't. But uh, sign me up for for being for being slightly pre-Christian. And we also do have some some later forms of it uh, uh, in a movement called Manichaeanism, uh, where it goes east and it actually sort of sort of combines a Buddha, uh, Buddhism and Buddhist mythology, and it uses Buddhist words, and they don't really talk about Jesus; they talk about Buddha instead. But still, some of this reinterpretation of, of the myth. So you know, in, in Gnosticism, the the snake. Is the good guy, the creator of, of this world is actually an, an inferior egoic deity that uh, doesn't uh, realize it's not the ultimate God and actually kind of wants to trap us in this world, right? So the God of Gnosticism is a flawed God. That's correct, yeah. And do you believe that? Uh, yes, but I, I don't know how literally I, I believe it. I, and and it sounds like a cop out when I say stuff like that, right, Jim? But well, we're, no, we're no, it, no, it doesn't. I know that these things can only be wrestled with. You know, they can only be wrestled with. And and what does it even mean to talk about these concepts as literal or on literal? Right? I, I don't know. What does it mean to say? Do you believe something? It's like how do you say whether or not you believe something that you believe? Yeah. It's hard to say. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's also like I think uh, just that notion of like pre-Christian versus not. There's also um, one thing that I've been I've been uh, listening to. I'll shout out to another podcast here, the Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast. And what you really get a sense of is that all like all of these things are just in this in this conversation with each other back and forth the whole way through, and that like um, so like Gnosticism as we define it is still like very influenced by like uh, Neoplatonism and Platonism and like a lot of these ideas that where they'd started to come up with this idea of like worlds within worlds or worlds outside of other worlds um, as wow. ways of, of, of thinking about the world. And a lot of these, and this is this is going to be kind of also segueing into another way to interpret Gnosticism, is that a lot of these are essentially a way for us to think about like, okay, we have a sense that the world could be better. Uh, why isn't it better? And various ways of interacting with that idea turn into a lot of the faiths that we now know. Um, uh, and I think uh, one of the one of the least religious ways of describing Gnosticism that I think is still so potent is that it's an act of, of uh, anamnesis, an act of remembering something you didn't know you'd forgotten um, about how about how the world can be, or about a connection to something quite wider and and richer than than the world you're living in, and then. And then I think the next question is, why don't I feel that all the time? Why am I disconnected from that? Maybe there's something in this world that is holding me back, keeping me down kind of thing. I'm stuck in attachments down here rather than thinking about up there. And then the more you kind of think into those things, the more it turns into a whole deep level of structure and ideas and philosophies and, 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 and ideas interacting with each other, which is, I think, that gets more into the academic historical side, but then I'm kind of, I think what I'm kind of talking about is more almost in a like Jungian, Joseph Campbellian, uh, um, uh, constant series of mythological interaction is kind of where, that's how I approach it quite often myself. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Did you read Voyage to Arcturus? I didn't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to eat the whole pie, a slice will do. 
<laughs> I, um, to be fair, Jonathan didn't give me a ton of notice <laughs> for this <laughs> show. Um, yeah. And so like I'd heard that the adaptation was already happening, but then it was like, hey, do you want to interview Jim about this? I'm like, yes. Oh, crap. <laughs> so I've been binging. The reason I ask is because uh, what you just described sound like it sounds like it would really resonate um, or that Voyage to Arcturus would really resonate with people who saw the world the way you just described it. Which is, I think, actually, that leads into one of Jonathan's questions, I think, quite well. Um, and also, actually, and maybe Jonathan, let me know if you want to, to go back to a different question, but like, uh, Alan Moore is doing the introduction for your book. Um, well, and... he's, he, wrote, he wrote a piece on the book and it's being reprinted. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, and now like this is a, this is a, an artistic creator who's dived deep into spiritualism and, and uh, some would say Gnosticism um, uh, as a, a, like his, his method of seeing imagination as a, as sort of um, parallel to, or, or as, as strong as the sort of physical reality that we're in. Um, uh, that's, I think, like, that's a good hook as to, as to, I think, why a lot of folks like Jonathan and I have have really grabbed hold of, of a book like this. Um, so that this isn't maybe a question so much as a, like, a subject I lay on the coffee table in front of us. Like, um, do you have any, any, any kind of responses to that uh, as to, like, maybe if, if you've seen that same reaction among other creators? I didn't quite follow that last part. Reaction to what from other creators? What reaction? Yeah. Like if other creators, if you, if you find, if you found, or if you can maybe speak to uh, how a lot of other artists have come to the voyage to Arcturus oh, in a oh. uh, like, in a spiritualist sense. Well, I don't know. I read Alan Moore's piece, and uh, he seemed to. I, I didn't read all of it, but he. So I can't. I shouldn't say. But what I did read was more about um, the book as it um, as it fit into other I'm not even going to try to paraphrase it but um, um, it, I, I think that a person as sophisticated as Alan Moore wouldn't be mistaking that book for a volume of spiritual wisdom I think he must be blown by the have his mind must be mind blown by the the level of creativity and original ideas that are in there. I think that impresses everybody. What am I even? Why am I going on like this? I just said I didn't read it. I don't know what he's talking about. I slip into these tangents. That don't get well. Me. I also Jim. didn't give you a very great like I gave you sort of a coffee table subject question, not a <laughs> not a direct question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, the thing, I mean, I'm glad he's doing it. It should help sell the book. He's a smart guy. When I do finally get around to reading his take on it, I'm sure it will be interesting. Well, you know, the way my mind slowed down. I was going, well, it's like I think maybe this, this is the effect of thinking about that book. Because uh, <laughs> it's indigestible. It, you, once you get into thinking about it and talking about it, your mind just slows down. Mm. And it's hard mm. to trudge. It's hard to get through it and think about. It. Take, for example, the, the, the passage where um, Masco comes upon a guy playing an organ or a musical instrument, which is a lake with his foot. And he wants to do it himself, so he kind of charges in there and takes over and doesn't destroys the, the area around the lake. Now, is this a hero or is this a jerk? Is this a fool? Is this a cautionary tale about what kind of a schmuck you might be if you went to another planet and suddenly realized, you know, you were responsible to anybody and could do whatever you wanted? Mm. I don't know. It, it, it posed as if he was like some Hemingway figure beating life at its own game or something. But he's to me, he's just, you know, he's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. Yeah. He yeah. Really his yeah. thoughts aren't good, but he's also like our representative on this other planet, and people give or they defer to him. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it at all. It's a difficult, thick, difficult book. Yeah. This, uh, Jonathan, I know I'm asking a lot of questions here. I have, I have no, one no, more no, thought. But is that okay? Uh, uh, I wonder, like, when you say the difficulty of it, 
And going back to the some of what we were talking about with, with Gnosticism having a, a, a sense of questioning why the world isn't better than it is. Um, maybe there's something holding us back, but also maybe there's something in the world to sort of puzzle out. Um, I guess I guess where I'm kind of going here is that uh, is that maybe some of the appeal of this book is the is like just the inscrutability leads you to just like it, it's it's the it's the like the addictive nature of a puzzle like you have to keep turning it over and thinking it through and engaging with it uh, which might also connect to this sort of this gnostic impulse of like trying to figure out the world you're in to see what's like hidden in these cracks of weirdness and strangeness that's a good question i it's hard for me to say what made me get through that book the several times i have because it isn't a lot of fun <laughs> to read in a lot of ways it, it's it's especially when you know what's coming but it's so <laughs> deep and i see yeah, my mind is slowing down because when you look into it and start examining the possibilities questioning why things happen what might really be happening what does it mean what did the author mean you just find that it branches out infinitely and you really don't know where to go with it or at least that's my experience with it mm. so compelling mm. a little bit like alice in wonderland in that it's it's it doesn't make any sense, but it also makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's you're saying, okay, something's happening here. There's a voice of authority here. This means something. But first, it's but but the something that it seems to mean never quite pans out. Somehow, it's just all these ideas that are put up. It's kind of like a Marvel movie. It's just kind of one amazing thing after another, but after a while you're just thinking, I don't ever need to see any more of this. I've had enough of this experience, except that when I don't do it, it's like the durian, I think I must get in that weird mood, you know? And I've done that where I thought, I wonder if I could just open that book and read it and slip into that thick green mm. mood. And it works, especially with this other book, especially with a book like The Haunted Woman. That, uh, you know, I go into those passages where they go upstairs into this room where they are able to communicate in a way that they're not otherwise. They still don't say anything, but they feel this kind of soul warmth. And again, there's nothing super sensuous about it, but that that just evokes that feeling in me, like looking at a photograph of uh, an old girlfriend or something. It just does something. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I Oh yeah, I, I was just interrupting to say that uh, uh, that this is uh, Talknosis is is the rant show, um, uh, Jim. Like we encourage our guests to, to to just get in there and rant and spin and generate ideas on the spot. So you know, don't don't feel feel free to 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 just go places as if you're on Arcturus wandering around. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the other thing too, and, and this is uh, the more of a comment and a question before my, my next comment. When when we do interviews like this with creators that are so important to us, with people that we admire like you, mm -hmm. I we were we're always scared of that like uh, Marshall McLuhan and Annie Hall mo uh, moment, right? <laughs> um, uh, but 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 something that's really happy for me and something that I have in my notes is how the book makes you feel. And you've mentioned it probably three or four times now, which is exactly, exactly how it made me feel. And I was trying to articulate it, right? You can see it in my notes. I was trying to tell my wife about it, but you're you're able to express how this this the consciousness changing, which isn't always pleasant uh, that this book right, does. Right. So, so I was also wondering about about your own work because I don't know how conscious da David Lindsay was, and we will never know if if this was what he was trying to do. But with your work, is this something you're also trying to do? Perhaps not to uh, have have this this murky impact, but to expand horizons and, and actually change consciousness at least for a little bit. Well. Uh... I guess the simple answer is I would love to be able to do work that had an effect like that on people. Uh, you know, where it induced a mood the way his work does. And I do see similarities between um, Voyage to Arcturus and this. I'm, I'm finishing up 
a long Frank story. It comprises earlier books with new material and it'll, it all, it'll be 400 pages long when it's done. And it's like a voyage to Arcturus in that it's episodic and it's got loops and it's got illusions and emergencing, emerging from illusions. And it's a very convoluted storyline, but it adds up to something. It goes somewhere. It makes a point. There's a story arc that makes it so that you can say what this story is about. There's a you know, a preamble, a conflict, the, the story of the conflict going um, big, and uh, then the resolution, and in, as in all Frank stories, the moral. Yeah. So, uh, in a sense, that's not like Voyage to Arcturus, because I can say what this book is about, and I can say what everything in it is about, and I defy anybody, including Lindsay to do that with Voyage to Arcturus. Yeah. So we um this this is a transition. So I'll just announce it instead of being slick. Um but so, so we we've mentioned Alan Moore because they're they're publishing his his piece with uh with your book. And that piece is actually out there now that now that you've mentioned I thought it was new, but uh but I can actually link it in the show notes. People can read it for themselves. Uh but Alan Moore uh, comes up on this show a lot because he he seems to think that there's there's a strong connection between creativity and what we call spirituality, religion, or even magic. Okay. Well, uh, let me first say I would appreciate it if you didn't link to that. I'd rather people discover it in the book. I don't okay. know where it is. I'll bet you can find it, but if it's all the same to you. I just assume you're not. Okay, read it in the book, folks. Read it in the book. <laughs> and, don't uh, Google it. Don't Google it. <clears throat> I don't feel that way. That okay. imagination uh, has anything whatsoever to do with. Um, what was it? What was it? He thought he had it. It's like, like religion, spirituality, magic. He sees them as intimately connected. Right. Well, he's uh, magic. I think is uh, something he's into. I don't even know what that means. I don't know if it means natural magic or Aleister Crowleyism or what. But uh, I'm a. I I think that. Your imagination is certainly an aid. If you're a devotee, you try to visualize your ishta, and your imagination is good for that. But you know, the, the Vedantists divide knowledge into vidya and avidya, knowledge that leads you away from the goal and knowledge that leads you to it. And if you want to use your imagination to lead you to the goal, you don't do it spinning fantasies. That is not a criticism of Alan Moore. It's, oh, no, no. Yeah. it's an observation. No, I really want what, what Jim thinks artist. about the topic. So, Alan Moore is uh, a great artist. I'm glad he's not a silent monk. I'm glad he's a productive artist. Yeah. Um, so now that we're on the topic of of uh, of a, a uh, I can never say it right, but Advanta, um, which is which is uh, a, a non-dual monistic view. Is 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 this your view? And have you have you found that? That there's something life changing about diving into Advanta as seeing the world through non dual eyes? Well, uh, seeing, the, seeing the world as non dual is the goal of Advaita Vedanta, but it's one of a number of philosophical his systems in Sanatana Dharma, and uh, a person who is typically a person who is. Uh, who believes in the guru system and who is a devotee. Um, they practice bhakti, which is devotional love of God. They also practice, that may be their main discipline, but they will also practice karma yoga. Mm -hmm. And they will also practice what they call yoga, which is Patanjali, you know, the idea that when your mind becomes silent, you, you experience God, the God that you are. And uh, Advaita Vedanta is the path of, is the path for the modern age, really, because it doesn't even have to mention God. It's the idea, it's the path of self-inquiry, of uh, neti neti, not this, not this, not this. And they say that once you determine everything in the world, that isn't God, 
you arrive at God. And once you arrive at God, you see that God is everything that you just negated. Yes. So it's a complicated process, but very few people, I think, are embrace one to the exclusion of the others. I'm basically a bhakta, but uh, nana yoga and meditation and uh, karma yoga are all not only indispensable, but they all have their own rewards. You you derive the, the fruits of uh, practice from doing them. They're enjoyable. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and, and there's some similarities, at least to me, to, to Gnosticism there, where, where Gnosticism seems very dualistic uh, when you first approach it, to kind of like that not this, not this, not this, right? That that, that feels like a form of dualism when you first start doing it. But as you said, you eventually, once you get through these layers of not this, not this, not this, where, where do we end up? You know, all this. Yeah. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, who knows? Yeah, who knows? I don't, <laughs> Jim. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I, I can only guess. Well, I think we're getting into the, the home stretch. Uh, the, a couple more questions. Just does does uh, does meditation or study of Advanta, do you, is, is that connected to your work at all? Does, does it help you with your work or is it completely in a separate basket? I'll give you the long answer. Please. My work is something that the universe gave me to do as kind of a workbook assignment so mm -hmm. that I would be able to get through life and make money and have an identity and show all those people that I wasn't totally worthless mm -hmm. and turn myself around and compensate for all of the things that kept me from being where I should have been earlier. My idea about Frank now is that when I am in my dotage and have lost my memory of everything, I will read the Frank books and it will impart to me information that I need for my final minutes. Mm -hmm. That's only halfway fanciful. There is something in my work that is you know, the unifactor, which where the Frank stories occur. That's a theater for my benefit. All the Frank stories, which I write as if they were dictated to me and draw at the expense of any kind of a normal life because I'm so slow and I spend all my time right here where you see me. Um, it's, it's for me, it's about me, it's to me. And it is part and parcel with the rest of my life, with my the, the path that led me to becoming a devotee and everything that I've derived from it. It's all one fluid gesture, this life. And as time goes on and I see it from a greater and greater distance, I marvel at the structure of everything and how it has worked out for me and how meaningful so many insignificant seeming and random things were and are and will i'm sure continue to be so that is the answer to whether or not meditation and everything is all it factors in my art my art and my meditation are gifts to get me out of here well, Jim, I, I, I have no follow-up questions after that. That is uh, an amazing statement from an amazing artist. Uh, before well, we... I mean, thanks for that. <laughs> Just to echo John, I, I did have some other thoughts, but I was like, no, that's such a great note. I think like nothing else, every, everything else is still just like sort of discussing a little extra uh, cul-de-sacs. Um, yeah, that was beautiful. <laughs> well, we probably should start wrapping up, but uh, uh, Jim, so this, uh, as I said, I think that this is going to become the the version of Voyage 2, or 2, I can never say it right, <laughs> I can't even say it, but I think it's going to be the version for the ages. So uh, I'm going to put it up here on the screen, beehivebooks.com, is that right, Jim? That's correct. 
Everybody, go out and buy a copy, and it's it's you can pre-order it, but it's not released yet, right? But That's you can correct. pre-order. Still in production, but they have lots of other great books. They have a copy of. Uh, well, you just have to go see. I can't I can't promote one about the others, but there's some <laughs> fantastic books there by some fantastic artists, and they're all beautifully designed and put together. The top of the line production values are just great. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, so uh, and for all things Jim, so go to Beehive Books, pre-order that book, um, and uh, I really highly recommend doing that because if you've been intrigued by, and I, I, I'm assuming if you are still listening, you are intrigued by a voice character because it is intriguing, but I am begging you, you will enjoy reading Jim's version much more than sitting down with the prose one. Uh, also, go to uh, jimwoodring.com, right, Jim? That's your um, uh, your homepage where people can find everything else that you do. Well, uh, it's not; it hasn't been updated in years. Probably the best thing to do is just Google image my name and click on images you like, and it'll lead you to places. Fantastic. Um, uh, I, I I did that just before the show, uh, just to kind of get some visual inspiration for things too. And uh, it's a great idea. Yeah, like some of the some really pop eye popping work really pops up. And Frank, which we've kind of has come up occasionally, and especially in that last answer, is uh, is also um, a character and a series of uh, books that you have that people can definitely if they're going if they're looking forward to Voyage to Arcturus, I think they'll probably also enjoy a lot of what you've got going on in Frank. Well, that's a nice thought. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, check out everything that Jason's doing at sagetheater.com. Also, uh, uh, the church that Jason and I are both a uh, member of, the AJC, Apostolic Joe and I's uh, church, does a yearly conclave, which is sort of a mix of a retreat and a convention. This year it's all online, uh, you know, mostly lectures, but you also get a chance to sort of mix and mingle with people online. It's in about, uh, it'll be about a, uh, the, the two, middle. Two weeks. Two weeks from, from recording, um, oh, and yeah. a week probably when this comes out. So oh, just go yeah. to <laughs> org conclave. Lots of great speakers, including Jason and I, but lots of mm -hmm. uh, because uh, lots of people uh, who aren't us who are even better. Um, and, <laughs> and finally, uh, since we talked about meditation, uh, I do uh, the secular mindfulness based meditation online every week for free. Feel free to join us. Uh, uh, we got a great group. It's mylensmeditation.substack.com. I slur my words. That's mile and meditation.substack.com. Okay, uh, Jim, uh, thanks again. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. You, uh, uh, I still don't know what this book is about or what this book is, but you've at least helped me to grapple with it. So thank you, Jim. Think of it as a drug. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it leads to an opposite state of consciousness. You read that book and it's like, like that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jason, for having me on this show. It's been interesting. You guys are interesting to talk to thanks for that oh good <laughs> yeah this was an honor i was i was happy to be here so <laughs> me too me too and i'm gonna go read up on gnosticism it sounds interesting <laughs> i think you'll find it very interesting goodbye, David. goodbye. <laughs> bye. bye adios